Everyone who is around Alan likes to sing with him. He knows how to make you sound and feel really good. I can tell you right away, something is gonna happen when you're around Alan Turi. Please welcome him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assessing right now. Will you start to sing without me telling you to? Or do I need to be more clear and direct with my music? That's what you can do when you improvise, right? You're getting a sense not just of what you're going to play, but what the response is. What are we doing together, right? Um, and I'm thinking right now that it might be nice just to sing in the pentatonic. We've heard so much beautiful music in the pentatonic uh, at these performances, and the combination of Western and Eastern is just so beautiful. So just as a warm-up, let's just sing in the pentatonic. Here are the notes, and you can make the decisions about what notes you want to play. So I'm noticing it's very soft. People are tentative, so maybe what I should do now is play a melody. Oh, we know that, right? Or... Or... Yeah. <laughs> American, very profound. <laughs> um, but the idea is that there's so much in common there. Right? And I am trying to figure out what to do. That's what we can do as improvising clinical musicians. It's the musical between that matters. Right? How are we, we relating? And to ask you to improvise is asking you to make certain decisions. Well, Alan's telling me to do it, so I will. Or Alan's telling me to do it, so I won't. Um, how loud will I be? What will the person next to me think of me? So there's all this social part of it, right? The relational part, also the physical. I don't have the energy to sing. Or is it appropriate for me to sing in this context? All of those things, all of those challenges, all of those factors come into improvising together. So, um, why don't we improvise, and let's see if we can, there are words up there, something is going to happen. Some of you may know it, some of you may not. Let's see if we can move into it. It's a, it's a, a famous Nordoff Robbins play song, so. All right, here's your introduction. Something is going to happen, to happen. What will it be? What will it be? Something is going to happen, to happen. We will wait and see what it will be. Ah, interesting. Nice singing. Now, interesting that you all felt it should go down. What it will be. So when we're listening to music, we're thinking about what comes next. And Paul Nordoff made a decision to not end that song on the tonic, but to end it on the fifth. What it will be. Because we're not finished. It's not final. So these are the kind of um, philosophical, the kind of uh, theoretical ideas that the tones matter, that music matters, and the way you play it matters, and how you play, 
and the timing of what you play is all very important. That's what excites me about music in special ed. So um, I am going to skip a lot of, I'm just going to say, here's the London Center, and some wonderful work goes on there. Um, I think you all know that the work started uh, in 1959, and in 1974 it was established at the London Center. It's kind of the um, flagship, and there's pictures from Australia. So, <clears throat> music-centered music therapy, that's where we're coming from. The dynamic form of music is rich in expressive qualities, such as rhythm, phrasing, melody, dynamics. Music thus provides a medium for communication and social interaction. Many of the basic principles of music therapy are related to the dynamics of nonverbal communication between parent and infant. And we heard some wonderful work yesterday in the, um, in the keynote uh, that Dr. Uh, Tuchik did, where you can hear the interaction and how it, the space, the responsiveness that was going on between the therapist and the young child. <clears throat> the work started with autism, working with children on the autism spectrum. Please realize, and I'm going to show you some work with um, young adults, that the work is not only in, with children, but Nordoff Robbins started off working with severely disabled children. So with autism spectrum disorders, the core symptoms are social isolation, difficulties with language and communication, and cognitive and behavioral rigidity. <clears throat> so oftentimes these nonverbal communications are hard to read uh, in, with children with autism. And so there are very early deficits in joint attention and social reciprocity, right? There's, there's not a link, there's not a sense that the child is relating. Now, even despite those deficits, the child's innate musicality can remain relatively intact. And engagement through music can thus provide experiences of communication and reciprocal interaction. So they started working to the Paul Nordoff was, was a wonderful composer and pianist, uh, and met Clive Robbins, who was really a pioneer himself as a special educator. And as I said, they worked with severe challenges in children. And there's a wonderful picture. Individual and group work. Um, in the group work, they, they did improvise songs, which then became um, kind of staples that they used for groups and created a body of uh, songbooks that they then used again, and people have been using these songs. Even though they were written in 1960 and 70, people are still using them today, and in different languages. <clears throat> I said all this. I don't even have to say it, just look at it. <laughs> all right, so the idea of the music child, that music accesses the healthy core potential for growth and development. I'm going to confess something to you right now. I love the concept of the music child. I don't like the title because I think people then associate, oh, Nordoff Robbins with children. You know, and it kind of limits the way you think. Adults have musical sensitivities, obviously, that are lying dormant too. So don't conf get confused about that um, title. So, uh, as I said, there are many different Nordoff Robbins um, therapists around the world. The London Center uh, was established first. Um, there's fantastic work that was going on in Germany, working with adults with um, neurological problems that spread through Europe, um, physical problems. All, it, it, this work is not population specific, all right? So um, Australia established a Nordoff Robbins facility. Um, the work has spread obviously here. People know about it. We're very excited about what's happening here in Asia. Um, there's been an association uh, for the study of Nordoff Robbins for many years in Japan. 
and in Korea we have uh, had a clinical training program at IWA and we're looking forward to the opening of an actual Korean music therapy training program coming up very, very soon. So the center at New York was started in 1989 and we do research, we do workshops, we do publication of materials. Um, and we do levels of training there. And that is a picture of Washington Square Park in New York in the village area, in case you're interested of that, what that is. And that's where we're located. I just like this picture, it's kind of cute. <laughs> okay, so um, special education, what we have um, been able to establish is uh, a program with the public schools where they bring children in to us and um, I'd like to play uh, a video now of the teacher who really established this connection with us. Um, and she talks a little bit about the groups that come to the center from the Board of Education and the goals and what she saw, not what we saw as music therapists, but she saw uh, from her point of view as a special educator what music therapy was doing for these children. And then there's a little surprise in, the, in there because I thought you'd like to see Clive, so Clive is in there talking a little bit too. So if we can play that video now. So we have quite a history and a wonderful relationship with the Nordoff Robbins Center here. We bring three groups of children here to Nordoff Robbins Center each week. Our children come from really all five boroughs. <laughs> On Monday, we bring a group of children with hearing impairments. On Tuesday, a group of children with autism, and on Wednesdays, my class, a group of children with multiple disabilities. Yeah. One of the students that I feel has really grown tremendously from... Oh, you can keep going. ...his participation here at Nauta Robbins is a... <laughs> oh, it's okay, it's all right. We're going to make mistakes. It's okay to make mistakes and make them in public. We're doing it right now. <laughs> it's all right. If we can feel we can do that, we can have a dialogue about things. We can talk about messy things, things we don't agree about. It's okay. We can do it. So if, if there's a problem, tell me and I'll just keep talking about something else. <laughs> uh, are we okay up there? This is not my music. A child named John Paul, he had difficulty with certain behaviors. Being able to express this musical intelligence really helped modify his behavior. Every week he said, Kathy, I had fun in music. tremendous impact on his sense of well-being, on developing appropriate social behaviors, as well as tremendous musical gift. And I really feel that was called forth here. There's something in the human being inborn, implanted in us as a species that is open to music, that needs music, that is fulfilled by music. So it's far more than entertainment even more than cultural enrichment. Oh, okay, stop, wait, wait. Just freeze it, freeze it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. By the way, people have asked about Clive. He's okay, he's, he's home, he's not in the hospital, and he sends his regards to everybody. Um, yeah, we can clap for Clive. <laughs> so those Bum, 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 bum. It almost sounded a little Korean, a little Korean drum-like, maybe. I mean, there's so much commonality, right, between music. Um, what you just saw there is what I'd like to show you, very brief excerpts of some young adults in a special education program. They're inner city, they're tough, they come from a tough neighborhood, various ethnicities, and they also have serious, some more serious than others, developmental delays, hearing impairments. And they're in a special education program. They're not going to go any further in school. 
This is as far as they're going to go. And so they're in a special program called the Transitional Program that the Board of Ed has created for them to learn the skills to get a job. Listening, cooperation, attention, taking turns, all the things that we're trying to cultivate through music making are things that they would like to see. Th those are skills that they will be able to harness in the workplace. And it's not so easy for them to do that. Right? Um, there's a history of it being very difficult for these young men to transition into the workplace. They're 16, 17. So one of the things that they did in their program was they came to music therapy. And what you just saw there, that little brief moment, was the way they started playing. Now, remember what it felt like for us to improvise. What do we do? What does Alan want? What should I express? How do I fit in? Right? That's what they were facing, too. And the way they played when they started in the beginning of the year was like that. Everybody playing the same beat. Everybody playing the same thing at the same time, very strong. Right? It's very short, but just if you could play, keep playing that excerpt, that would be great, and then stop. together and they changed the way they were playing together, right? I'm trying to encourage them to play in different ways through the way I'm playing with them. Can they pause? Can they play different instruments? Can they take different roles in the instruments? Can they become um, less defensive and more open to hearing each other? And so now, this is a little bit later in the year. And notice that they're still playing a very strong pulse, very strong pulse, but they each have their own part. And this is all improvised. They found different instruments to play. They're playing more melody instruments. Um, so to see, and, and it sounds good. There's a sense of cohesion among them. So again, it's a very short excerpt. on the steel drum. I didn't tell him. The, the, that steel drum had every single note, you know, very expressive. The person sitting next to me at the piano has a hearing impairment, and he always wanted to sit close to me because he was afraid of making a mistake, right? But he was trying out different things. So taking risks, taking the next step, what we call the developmental threshold. Where, where is that person musically, and where can they go next? What would be the next challenge for them that they're not doing next? Right? That they're not doing, that they could possibly do next? Sorry. OK, so now this last, ex it's interesting what was happening outside of the sessions was the person who ran the program said, hey, what's going on in there? These guys are starting to get along better. They're talking to each other when they come in the morning. They seem to have more respect for each other. And there was less of a sense in the, in the sessions themselves of vying for whose attention and more support among the playing. So this is now the last excerpt. It's again, very short, but notice now the music is not as pulse-driven. 
it, there's a contemplation about it. There's um, maybe even a little more unsure feeling in there. Um, maybe it's not so confident, but it's more open. More, they're more receptive to each other and what's going to happen next. See if you notice that. It's very short. Last excerpt. of sadness in the music, um, the slowness of it, the kind of contemplation, I think was also a reflection of the fact that we were coming to an end. They loved this program so much that the year after this, one of them came back just to visit and wondered if he could work at the center. You know, so they really made a very strong connection to us. And the good news, and this is, there's no proof that music therapy did this, I'm talking as a clinician, not as a researcher. The good news is that for the first time in this program, all of those young men were able to get jobs. Now the person who ran the program said, yes, I think it was music therapy that made the difference. And of course we need some more empirical data about things like that. So um, I just wanted to give you a, a, a quick um, feeling of how the process, the music making changes through time, and that reflects the, the participants' changes. And that's a big philosophical underpinning of the Nordoff Robbins approach. Okay. Research. Yeah. I think that Nordoff Robbins, the very, very, very good research that's come out of the Nordoff Robbins centers um, has. I think legitimized music-centered music therapy. And the qualitative case studies have been very, very powerful. People recognize it as something that supports this kind of work. But there is a need, <clears throat> and it's in the literature, of course, and everybody knows this, for experimental studies of broader scope, uh, examining interventions which are closer to clinical practice and which address in depth the children's developmental goals in domains such as communication, and social interaction. So um, we have gotten the support of New York University. We're working with an applied psychologist. And we have developed an instrument to measure communication and social interaction skills. And we call it the MTCSI. It sounds a little bit like the American television show. We thought it would help people to remember it. <laughs> Um, now, I think I said this, but I'll say it again. Every one of our sessions is videotaped, is recorded. For clinical reasons, we're in there working as spontaneous, we're creating music in the moment, and then the indexing, the recording, it's studied very carefully. What was the child's response? What do we want to bring back musically? So that's a very important component of the clinical work. And, you, and, and I think some people make the case that Nordoff and Robbins were doing research on their own work. So we're using those videotapes also to develop this scale. The violin, too, is a well-established scale that um, has been used to measure different domains uh, working with children with developmental disabilities. So the idea is we're going to use this Vineland behavior scale, right? Here are the domains, communication, daily living skills, socialization, motor skills. So this is an established scale. And so we're looking at um, 
let me just say this for a second. We are looking at what can we correlate our scale, the MTCSI, with the violin to see if there's validity. And we have been able to do that. I'm looking over, Petra. I'm looking over. <laughs> just give me a sign. One, two, three, five. five. Really? Five? Okay. <laughs> it says you have five more minutes. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So um, as many of you know who work with children with autism, there are often disparities among these different domains. They may be very high on one level, low on another, right? Their literacy skills may far outstrip their receptive and spontaneous expressive language, for instance. So, oh, here's an example of the violin uh, and the scores of those disparities. You can see different levels. So, we are doing a field, we were doing uh, and we still are doing a field study at a school in the Bronx. Uh, 35 children, age 2 to 5, predominantly diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. Now it just so happens that the school had organized music therapy to be, we're going to give half the children music therapy in the beginning and half at the um, second half of the year. We didn't ask for that, they just did that because of financial situations, but it was perfect for us to do a lag cohort design, right? So approximately half of the children receive music therapy in the fall, half in the spring. All right. So we gave the violin to, to parents and teachers at the beginning, the middle, and the end of the academic year. And the MTCSI was used for coding music therapy sessions. I want to just see if I can get to uh, an example of, yeah. So here's some of the things that the MTCSI codes. And I want to emphasize that we ask our clinicians in the training to learn about this scale because it helps clinicians to be more precise about what their goals are. Right? So the coded behaviors include instrument use, vocalization, movement, gesture, eye contact, facial expression, parallel play, joint attention, that's a big one. And it's something that music therapy does so well, right? To help the child relate to something with you. And we coded them in one minute intervals. Now imagine how long that's going to take us. <laughs> one minute intervals. That's a lot of looking at and, 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 but we're finding a lot of really good data. Here's an example of joining in. This is one of the um, uh, categories. And joining in really, if you think about it in, 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 in the language that uh, other disciplines would understand, is really joint attention in a sense. So joining in an activity with a therapist or peer is the usual point of entry into engagement. And so we say code as follows. Give them a one if their simultaneous participation in an activity with the therapist with little communication or social interaction and parallel play. And I'll just stop there. Then number two is with intermittent communication or interaction. And number three is with simultaneous participation with sustained communication or interaction. What's great about this is we are finding that with training, people are scoring them similarly. Let me just say that, um, one minute, one, okay, one. You know, Paul Noroff and Clive Robbins created these fantastic scales. Scales of evaluation, the tempo dynamic schema, the child therapist relationship in music activity. But it was very difficult to establish reliability in the scoring. John Mahoney has done some studies on this, um, and, and so there's some possibilities. But what we did was we took those scales and we tried to take the essence of what was in them to make this MTCSI. So we're very excited about the potential of this scale. Um, in actually being able to do the kind of research that we think is needed in the field. Um, you know, obviously we're going to continue to do qualitative research, um, but, but now, uh, you know, we're also establishing something uh, uh, that I think is, he is heading in a, in a different direction for how people usually associate in order for Robinson research. I thank you for your attention. Um, and do I shake your hand now? You shake my hand. Okay, all right. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you, Dr. Alan Terry.